Today on Home Theater Fanatics, we're gonna build a touchscreen streamer for Room. I think like the rest of you, I've been looking for a really good way to consume music. You know, starting way back with physical media and LPs and cassette tapes and CDs and that kind of stuff, that's great, but it's never been really convenient for me. I've wanted something different. Then streaming media came along and files and those kinds of things, and that was great, but it was still a hassle to, you know, get copies of the stuff that you want or rip your CDs and store them and that kind of thing. But Finally, there's a tool that I actually really enjoy listening to music through, and that's called a Brune. And this is a server that you install on a piece of software, typically a desktop computer, or you can buy a, a special Rune Core box, uh, lots of different ways to go about it. But the great part about this is that it kind of aggregates everything, and you don't have to worry about physical media. And the great thing is if you use a streaming service, you can take your digital music and have it appear right alongside all of the different songs that you can stream as well. And I use Rune with Tidal and Cobas uh, alongside my local file share with all of those files and it creates one nice experience where you can listen to your music but also have suggestions for new things from the Rune software that you might want to listen to and if you have a streaming service more often than not you can go and listen to it it's really really cool now the only problem and I don't guess it's really a problem it's just building the system out is that you have to have some way to get the music from that Rune server to your speakers and typically Typically, you'll use some type of streaming device or a Rune endpoint to get that done. And today, we're going to take a look at building one of those ourselves. So you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. You can actually buy all these bits and pieces yourself and put a really good system together for, I don't know, 200 bucks or so, and it'll be audiophile quality, top in, top tier. The first item that you need is the core of the system, which is a small computer called the Raspberry Pi. Now, since we're building a touch screen version, which is really, really Really awesome. I mean, and you'll you'll see how this looks. It's cool. Um, you need a case that can hold both the Raspberry Pi as well as the touchscreen. So you have to have a special case, and then you actually have to have the touchscreen itself. And we're going to use the seven-inch Raspberry Pi touchscreen. So it's kind of like the official one, and it works really easily. You don't have to go out and try to figure out drivers and all kinds of different configuration stuff. You kind of plug it in, and it pretty much works. Outside of that, you also need a micro SD card. This is gonna hold your software. And now the cool thing about this streamer that we're gonna build, you can use it as a Rune endpoint. Um, now, it's really called a Rune bridge if you wanna get technical about the exact term. And it runs a piece of software called Ropi, R-O-P-I-E-E-E. -E -E. But you can load other things on this. So if you wanted to have a standalone environment that didn't use Rune, you could also use a tool called Volumio. And uh, this, this hardware is interchangeable. So you could take a couple of different SD cards if you wanted to, micro SD cards, and load different software on and shove that card in uh, depending on what your use case is for that particular day. But we're gonna focus on the Rune endpoint, which is the one that I really, really enjoy. So you've got your Raspberry Pi, you've got your case, you've got your touch screen, and you got your micro SD card. We're gonna go through and show you how to put all these together. And then after that, we'll show you how to deal with the software. So let's go ahead and start building. Taking a look at the different components that you need for this build. So you can see in the bottom corner of the screen, I've already unboxed the Raspberry Pi and uh, that guy is really, really tiny, uh, which really lends itself to this type of application because it is so small, you can make the footprint of the device very small as well. Now, what we're gonna look at here is the actual case that we're gonna put this in. And uh, this case is a little bit larger than what you would normally find with a Raspberry Pi build simply because it has to hold a seven inch touchscreen. And the touchscreen is really what makes this magical. It's important to note that the screen comes with a number of important components, the ribbon cables, the power cables, uh, and the fan. The fan is optional. I installed it, but then removed it. It was a little loud and it didn't appear that the extra cooling was needed in this environment. As far as tools are concerned, all you really need is a very small Phillips head screwdriver. That'll get you through the entire build. Now let's talk about the touchscreen. There are a few things to be aware of. First, the touchscreen runs off its own power, so there is a plug for that. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the case actually comes with a nice Y adapter, so you can run power to both the Raspberry Pi 
and to the touchscreen without having to run two different cables out. So that's really slick that that was included with the case. It'll be very important for you to make sure you don't lose that piece. Now, the ribbon cables are also very important because that's going to be how this touchscreen connects back to the Raspberry Pi. You're not going to do some kind of HDMI out and then into the monitor. It's actually going to be with the uh, little ribbon cable. It's white with uh, printing on one end. Once you have the screen out, one thing you need to do to prepare it for installation in this application is to remove the four standoffs that are on the back. I don't really know what they're for. I guess there are other cases that you need that for, but in this application, you'll take each of those four standoffs off and then use the four included screws to then connect that PCB to the back of the display. At this point, it's time to install the ribbon cable to the back of the display. Now, be careful and notice which side has the bare wire available and you're gonna want that facing up as you insert it into that brown connector. The brown connector's got a little slide piece that slides forward and backward. You'll need to slide it out so that you can insert the ribbon cable and then you'll use a device like your screwdriver to then push each of the edges back in to firmly attach that ribbon cable to the PCB. With the ribbon installed, it's now time to put the monitor into the case itself. Watch closely and you can see where the ribbon will fit into the case. Slide that through, then gently push the monitor into place, flip it over, and you'll have four spots where you will use screws to then attach the monitor firmly to that plastic case. Now it's time to install the trim piece to the side of the display. If you're gonna use a camera, there is a trim piece that would allow you to mount a camera behind it and then use this as a video conference endpoint. For our application though, you don't need that. So you'll simply push in the completely solid piece of plastic, making sure not to catch the uh, film off the display. And then when you flip this over, there are a number of screws that you'll install to uh, snug that up. Up next is the installation of the actual Raspberry Pi. Now, pro tip here, it's good to go ahead and finish all of the software installation onto your micro SD card, put that into the Pi and then perform this step. Um, I learned much to my chagrin later that the card is not accessible once you get this installed and everything closed up. So you can't easily swap the cards out. So uh, make sure you watch this video all the way to the end, get all of your software loaded onto the card, jam that in there and then install this on the back of the case. Um, when you install this on the case, there won't be any screws that hold the actual Raspberry Pi onto the case. You'll see how there's a plastic cover that snaps into place that holds it solid. Um, so don't worry, you didn't miss anything uh, from that point of view. All you need to do is set the Raspberry Pi on the standoffs on the case install the ribbon cable and it can only go one way at this point just like you did onto the display pcb so it's got the same kind of connector then you'll push the ribbon cable down and put a crease in it so that it'll sit flush against the actual raspberry pi as i said before the fan installation is optional now i'm going to go ahead and show this to you so you can see how it's done if you do want to install the fan um, you might want to install the fan, but not actually plug it in because I think it does look a little bit better that way. However, if you do want to run the fan, there are a couple of different settings that you can run the fan at to determine the speed that it'll spin at. And that is determined by the way that you put the jumpers onto those header pins on the back of the Raspberry Pi. Take a look at the instructions and it'll show you which pins you'll connect the fan to to make it spin at whatever speed is most appropriate for you. With the fan connected, that back plate simply hinges in on one side and then clicks into place on the other. At this point, the case is completely assembled with the exception of the base. The base easily attaches with two screws, one on either side. The last step for the case assembly is to attach the power cable. 
Grab that Y cable we discussed before, plug one end into the Raspberry Pi and the other end into the touchscreen and you are good to go. Now we're gonna install the Ropey software on the micro SD card. First off, let's get this SD card inserted into the computer so you can actually do something to it. To install the Ropey software, there are three different steps we need to take. First, we need to go and grab the actual Ropey software. Second, we have to download a tool that will allow you to write that software to your micro SD card. And then third, we need to actually go ahead and write that data to the card. So we're gonna get the information, get a tool to write it, and then we're gonna install that tool and then write the data to your card. From there, you can then install it back into your Raspberry Pi and boot that guy up. I'm gonna put the link down below so you can get to the Ropey website. From here, you can do the download and then also there's a link to the etcher tool that you'll use to do the actual burning of that image to your micro SD card. To grab the newest version of Ropey, you can click on the link on this page. Once that download finishes, then you can move on to installing the etcher application. You can click on the link on this page and it'll download that app for you. Once the etcher application is downloaded, go ahead and just click on the app download icon at the bottom left of your screen, and that'll pop open the installation window. Just follow the instructions, the install is very straightforward. Once the installation completes, the application will open automatically. From here, you need to select to flash from a file, go and find that original file that you downloaded, select the file, then it will allow you to select the target, and this will be the micro SD card that you installed before, and then you click the go button. The app will take a few minutes as it goes through and flashes the card and then validates the installation. If you haven't done so yet, this is the spot where you go back and install this micro SD card in your Raspberry Pi. It's not too hard if you've got everything assembled. You just take the back piece off, the little fan cover, and then you can loosen the pie up enough to get at the SD card slot, which sits right underneath that ribbon cable for the display. Now that the physical build is done and the software is installed on your micro SD card, it's time to go ahead and boot up this guy for the first time. Make sure to plug up your ethernet as well as your power. Once the power is connected, go ahead and flip the on button and you can watch the unit boot for the first time. This first boot will take the longest of all of them as it does a lot of configuration and installation during this initial setup. Make sure to have ethernet connected because it does need to talk to the internet to grab additional components. Once the initial boot is done, you'll notice that things look a little weird. Yeah, the screen's upside down. So at this point, we need to configure the Ropey device and we also need to configure Rune to talk to the Ropey device. If you flip the Rune bridge over, you can see down at the bottom there's gonna be an IP address. That's the thing that starts with HTTP. This is what we're going to input into our web browser so that we can manage this box. Now jump over to any computer that's on the same network as the Ropey and type into your web browser, ropey.local. That will get you to the configuration page of your new Rune bridge. You can disable the welcome message, click continue, and then navigate to display. Once on the display tab, you'll go down to orientation and change that to default. Then you will commit the change and then save the change. Once the save completes, you'll need to reboot your device. So go ahead and hit that reboot button in the top right and let it reboot. Now it's time to install the DAC. In this instance, I'm going to use a topping E30 DAC and I'm gonna use two different USB cables to connect it to the Rune bridge. One is gonna carry the data and the other one is gonna be used for power. That's right, the Rune bridge will actually power the DAC directly over USB. Once everything's connected, go ahead and hit the power button and let it boot back up. The last two steps are to enable the Ropey extension in the Rune app and then finally to configure the zone name in the Rune app to match the zone name that you have in the Ropey configuration. To get started, open the Rune app, go to settings, then go to extensions, then click on enable by the discovered Ropey remote control extension. Once that is complete, go to the audio section in the settings, scroll down till you find your DAC, then click on the enable button. This will allow you to then input a name for that particular zone. 
name it something easy to remember and type because you'll then need to go and configure that in the ropey configuration itself. Once back in the ropey configuration web page, navigate to display and then under room control zone, type in the same name that you input in the configuration for rune. At this point, you can commit the change, then save the change, and then finally reboot the device. When the reboot is complete, you'll then be ready to use your new rune bridge. And let me tell you what, it's pretty dang cool. So that's the whole process of building one of these touchscreen units. It's kind of long, but I think in the end, it's very worthwhile. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If so, please like and subscribe, drop some comments down below and let me know how this worked out for you. If there's anything I left out or anything else that we should cover in a video like this in the future. And as always, thank you so much and we'll see you in the next video.